Hey everybody, welcome back to Cooper Stuff. How's it going? Hope everybody had an awesome Thanksgiving week with your family, all right? There's a lot of serious things going on in the world, but you know what I wanted to do? A couple things. I need to take a break from serious stuff. Today's going to be a fun episode. We have on the Babylon Bee, all right? Um, if you're not familiar with the Babylon Bee, what are you waiting on? It's the funniest site on planet Earth, all right? Um, I filmed this a couple of weeks ago in preparation for this week. And since then, Babylon B has uh, been invited back on to Twitter, all right? There's a whole thing going on with that. They're back on Twitter, so we allude to it in the episode. At the time we recorded it, they were not back on Twitter. They are now, which is good news. But that brings me to a couple of personal things I would like to tell you. Number one... This is not a serious episode, but it's an awesome one. Um, it's not serious uh, for lots of reasons. Number one, I need a break. Is it okay to admit I need a break from the insanity? Everything is absolutely nuts. Number two, on a personal note, I would like to tell you guys for the first time, I officially finished the first draft of my entire book. This week, I finished it Thanksgiving Day at noon, and I'm telling you, it was a huge weight off because my head has been so in it. It's been really hard to focus on other things. So another reason we're not covering so much of this serious stuff is that I haven't had time to put my head into it. Frankly, I haven't had time. And then secondly, I need a break from it. Is that okay? Do you feel like you need a break from the insanity? It is insane. So uh, I will be announcing um, you know, the book co coming a little bit later. Uh, not in this episode, but maybe in a month or something like that. We're beginning the editing process now. So I wanted to tell you guys that. Next thing I want to tell you, a lot of people know, I have brand new merch up. If you... If you smell something commies and you want a mug or a shirt that says it, it's on Cooper Stuff Merch. So go check out johnlcooper.com for all of that. While you're at my website, do me a favor and sign up for, um, uh, not that we have a newsletter, but go ahead and give me your email address because you never know what's going to happen. Case in point, Babylon B had been off of Twitter for like six months, all right? We just don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I'm kind of just as a uh, safeguard for that. Go ahead and give me your email address so I can have it for when the book is coming out and in case something bizarre happens. The last thing I want to tell you before we jump into this awesome episode, talking about the volatility of things, as you know, it's always a good idea to consider diversifying your investments. And if you're looking for something to do that, I would uh, suggest to you guys to check out my friends at SD Bullion, all right? All you got to do is text the word COOPER to 465-322. That spells GOLD22. We're geniuses over here. We make up awesome stuff like GOLD22. Text the word COOPER. Here's what they're going to do. They're going to send you a free brochure, free information on what it means to invest a little bit of your money into precious metals, gold and silver, that sort of thing. Basically, what happens is this. The government starts to print a ton of money. I don't know, like if they're spending more money than has ever existed on planet Earth, all right, for all sorts of stuff. What happens is that the value of the dollar, the value of your uh, funds for your investment funds for when you know you retire and this, that, and the other, those start to go down, all right? And if you want to protect against that inflation, you might want to put a little bit of money into precious metals. That's what it's all about. They are a Christian company. They have awesome stuff. They send shipped straight to your door. I've got all of my uh, gold and silver, mainly silver, because I just dig it, to my door from SD Bullion. So you want to check that out. And if it's your first time ordering, they will give you a discount if you use my code. Text Cooper to 465-322. Get started today. Now let's jump into a very fun, lighthearted, because we all need it, because the world has lost its ever-loving mind, a sweet episode with Cooper Stuff. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Cooper Stuff. This is going to be, it better be funny. If these guys aren't funny today, then I don't know why I'm wasting my time. I'm going to be doing this sweet interview with some of the guys from the Babylon B. How's it going, guys? We got Kyle and David over here. We're doing no great. Kyle and Adam. Hey, Kyle, Kyle and Adam, Adam. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Man, it, it's funny already. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I literally how I told jokes. you his name like a minute ago, dude. <laughs> how, how old are you again? So, uh, well, I know, but it's good to be here. Well, I'm a big fan it. of Striper. <laughs> <laughs> see? Yeah, see, we're getting started right. I'm such an idiot. My wife's no going to just, 
she's going to make fun of me so bad because I'm always getting names wrong. Something about my brain. Oh, I, 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 do too. I don't hold that against anyone. I forget names all the time. Oh, man, I'm so good. So you can call me Striper or Skittle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Either one. That's Skittle, I've been. Man. Yeah, we've been introduced as Skittle more than <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for joining me. How's it going over there? It's going great, man. Going good, yeah. Telling jokes. And Adam's the funny one, by the way. So we're all funny. All the pressure we're all funny is on here. Him to say <laughs> I write we're funny all... things, but he writes funny things and he does stand up. So he's the actual funny one. Ah, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, I got my start in stand up. Yep. Oh, no. I had no idea that that was the case. So how did you go from stand up to doing this? Uh, I started stand up about 15 years ago. I, I worked in Hollywood, basically. I, I started in New York. I was a assistant at Late Night with Conan O'Brien for six years, moved out to L.A. when he took over The Tonight Show. Then I got a writing job at Ellen. I wrote for Ellen for 10 years. And while I was there, I started doing stand up, um, got a couple of TV gigs doing uh, clubs. And then these guys had me on the podcast as a guest comedian. And then um, after I left Ellen, I started freelancing here and then became full time. Wow. So you you so you finally stepped up to a real gig after Ellen exactly. and uh, Conan. I, I was slowly <laughs> trying to work my way up to podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> Living the dream. Yeah, was, With, he's got a climb of Ellen, stand up comedy, Babylon B. Yeah. So he's arrived. Uh, I don't know where there's there's nowhere to go after that. But in <laughs> fairness, yes. in fairness, and I know that I'm biased. Babylon B is the absolute funniest thing on planet Earth right now. Uh, I mean, there's no question about that. So really, there is nowhere left to go quite seriously. Do you think it's funnier? You think it's funnier than Ellen? I think it is. A, it's Ellen's <laughs> funny in a different in a different sort of way. Yeah. I wonder no, what the Venn diagram of our overlapping audiences the audience. are. Yeah. There's probably a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah. like, like a little bit. Yeah. Like my wife likes Ellen. Yeah. She, I know a lot of people like sometimes. Ellen, yeah. So he's plugging his ear. You're not the Ellen yeah. demographic, I guess. No, I'm, I'm pushing my earbuds in. My, oh, we I thought you were plugging your ears. <laughs> plugging my ears. I'm done listening to you guys. We had a uh, an ice storm here and uh, it knocked my internet out. I, and, and right before the interview, I had to rush up here and put my phone on. And so that's why we're doing it here. Anyway, so I got these little earbuds on, which this just looks cool when I do. It's a new thing the young kids are doing. It looks yeah. like this. And where yes. is that your base again that you got an ice storm? Uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. That uh, that's what that's what I've heard. So all right. So uh, one of the things I want to say about about Babylon B that is so funny is that all right. There's, there's two things. Number one, um, you really. Well, I, I'll say the greatest thing. You really have to know the Bible really well to make half the jokes you guys make. And I wonder. Is, like, is it a prerequisite that everybody has to go through some sort of you know, a Bible school training in order to be a, a writer for the, the religion jokes? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's an intensive course. <laughs> it's like a 15 year <clears throat> graduate program before you can write a Bible joke. <laughs> for sure. It yeah, should no, be. <laughs> I mean, I think the Bible humor is great because that inside baseball stuff, it, it's the stuff that I like the most, you know, because it's. I think when we started writing our our humor, you know, we weren't writing it thinking we were going to make these giant viral hits because we wrote a joke about a worship leader. You know, <laughs> it was just writing stuff that was true to our experience in the church. And we all have different we all have tons of different backgrounds, like where we come from denominationally and stuff. Uh, but we were just writing stuff that was true to us. You know, like I grew up in and, you know, the fog machine and the lasers and the you know, worship leaders that were singing skillet songs on Sunday mornings, you know, that kind of stuff that we would just make fun of. And um, it, it was like crazy how viral that would go, that people were like, oh, that happened in our church too. <laughs> you know, so it just, there was something about writing something that had a kernel of truth to it that people connected with. I think I'm probably the one that they gave the biggest waiver on and not having a <laughs> theological back. I, I was raised, you know, I'm, I'm Christian. I was raised Christian. Uh, I appreciate the Christian humor here. But sometimes, you know, when we do podcasts and there's like theologians on and stuff, I feel like I'm in over well, my no, head. <laughs> I feel like you're pretty theologically or biblically aware, but yes. you're not, you don't have the, 
Christian pop culture experience. Yeah, that, that's more. exactly it. I, I I know the Bible well, but I didn't grow up in in a church or a family where we were kind of immersed in all the aspects of Christian pop culture. Those are the references that are kind of lost. He's one me. of the the actual Lutherans. Yeah, like not the ones <laughs> that are like with the rainbow. No, Lutheran not Lutheran. the yeah. There's there's the yeah. Right. Missouri one of the Lutheran. the actual <laughs> yeah. well it's, it's funny you say that because that what i was going to say and i decided not to was when i said there's two aspects and i said well let's just say the one but it's funny you mentioned that it's because to to do the christian humor you you kind of have to know both aspects there's the the cultural aspect which is the things that we all kind of go to church doing and we go oh yeah that is kind of funny and there are some uh, christian comedians that are quite funny on those aspects. It's the things that we do that we think are normal in pop culture. But what Babylon B has that a lot of other Christian comedians don't have is that it is inside baseball. You kind of have to, you kind of have to know these characters to even understand. I just wonder how many people look at this and don't get it at all. And, and it'll make me laugh out loud. And, and my wife is <laughs> constantly going, did you see this? And I think, how do people even know what this means? It's just so funny. <laughs> There's some pretty, there's some jokes that we do where I, I'll pitch the joke or one of the writers will pitch the joke and I go, I know that there's only about five people who are going to get this, but I love it so much that we have to do it. You know, you just have to be committed to the, the character and voice of the website, you know, that we know that when you, when, when I go to, when I go to like a, a convention or I speak at a conference or something, there's always someone who comes up to me and is like, you know what my favorite headline is? And they like list something that I'm like, I didn't think anybody read that joke <laughs> because it's something that was so, you know, uh, that was so inside. One of the really early inside ones we did was the, um, um, I'm not going to say it right. The Amaraldian basketball team. Do you know what Amaraldianism is? No, I don't. It's, it's four point Calvinism. Oh and really? So, <laughs> and so we did a joke that was like Amiraldian basketball team only scores four points. <laughs> and I'll get I will get like like more than one time someone has come up to me and said, That's my favorite joke on the Babylon B. You know, and you're just like, Really that one? But it's cool. I love when someone like the the humor works because someone feels like, oh, there is someone else out there who, you know, that they feel like they're inside because they get this really obscure reference. <laughs> what, uh, some what, ones, what, some of the religious ones are the funniest ones, though. Yeah. Like one of the ones I loved before I even started working here, it was, uh, it was Seventh day Adventist goes out for delicious hot fudge Saturday. <laughs> that was so dumb, but I always loved that. Super one. dumb. Yeah. Super dumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, uh, what is the missing letter? Is it limited atonement? What what's the missing letter? Oh, for Amaraldians? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's limited atonement. All right, yeah. yeah. Okay. They won't won't subscribe to you. Yeah. <laughs> and then all the Calvinists go go mental. You have to have all five or you can't have or any of five it. or you're an or you're a five point Arminian. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The <laughs> they'll they'll spit you out of their mouths if uh yeah, if yeah that's you right. Have all it, five points, yeah. Five or nothing, and by nothing we mean like uh, completely unsaved. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 quite funny. My friend Matt sent me uh, a vi the video that you guys did. It was uh, it was the the like the walkout theme music for pastors. It, okay. it was like, do you know what I mean? It was like the each one of the there's like five speakers. They had like their oh, rock yeah, song, we, their the theme entrance. song. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we did that as a video, but we did do it as like, a Oh, list. not video. Excuse me. Know, a list. Yeah. 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 Do, yeah we did do, the walkout. The, you know, I don't remember like John MacArthur comes out to ACDC's Thunderstruck or something. <laughs> like that. The different... <laughs> that was, that was pretty epic. <laughs> did we pick really... any skillet songs? Now I feel bad if we didn't pick any no, skillet songs. Well, uh, that's why I'm bringing it up. I would like you oh, to okay. feel <laughs> a little, uh, a little bit, repentant would be nice well i could edit uh, it real quick i could add one is there a specific <laughs> is there a specific pastor or christian personality you would want to uh, walk out music used for can we do james a, white james white walking out to uh to monster or something like that should we i i don't know uh, that's that's the thing it depends on who you pair us with because uh you know when, when you pair somebody together 
Oh man, it, 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 that's what was so genius about it was the uh, the various pairings was just just really made me giggle. So we could have um, Benny Hinn walk out to a skillet song. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, we already know what Benny Hinn's is. You know, we've all seen that video. Uh, <laughs> the let the bodies let hit the, the bodies floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've all we already have you know ever that. Seen that video. The, uh, I have. Yeah, uh, the parody. I, I, on, I actually have seen that on YouTube. Video. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pop culture. Yes. Christian culture reference. Well, more because understand. of my. Familiarity with let the bodies hit the floor than my familiarity with Benny Hinn. Have you but, seen yeah. the one where they put like the Hadouken uh, blast coming out of his hands? Yes, they I've seen that one also. Yes, yes you, man. I have. Awesome. Yeah, this guy understands Christian culture. Mm -hmm. Those are videos yeah. I have seen. Yeah, <laughs> he's ready to work at the Babylon Bee. Um, yes. We could have yeah. had on our list. I don't know if we did. We could have had um, Joel Osteen with some flogging Molly or some <laughs> Irish rock coming out. <laughs> Joel Osteen. He's the Irish, Irish version, version of Joel Osteen. Of Joel Osteen. <laughs> you put a little apostrophe, Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. Yeah, Osteen. See, One of our I hate was... mails that we received, someone misspelled his name that way with the apostrophe. So we've oh. just been calling him Joel Osteen. <laughs> Joel Osteen. <laughs> it's really funny to us anyway. It, it should be. You guys take a, per, a particular <laughs> ire, I've noticed, at Joel Osteen. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you, you do. Um but, so before we get into, to, I, I want to ask you only one serious question. But beforehand, I got to give a shout out to the to the book oh, nice. here. Um, got the, the book, look at that. The Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. Yeah, my wife bought like ten of them for Chris for Christmas <laughs> gifts. Um, all of our sales came. From. It was all it was guide to all from my wife. Yes. <laughs> We thought it was doing well, but it was just it one was family. Just one person. We're big supporters, man. Yeah. We're big supporters. <laughs> I mean, this book is absolutely hysterical. When it came out last year, I was just dying. Here's the best, the best and truest definition of woke. Um, right, right the, on page one. Being woke means wokeness isn't a private religion you can keep to yourself. Once you see the world through woke eyes, you'll never be the same and you'll never be able to stop telling your friends about your new beliefs. Kind of like when you join CrossFit. <laughs> <I'm just> thinking, <laughs> that's, that's just like the truest, the truest <laughs> analogy ever. I mean, the minute you start, my friend always says that CrossFit is, uh, it's the opposite rules of Fight Club, you know, like Fight Club, the only <laughs> rules to not tell people. Yeah. CrossFit. Anyway, this, this is hilarious. So how many people got involved in order to write this book? Uh, there was a team of four or five people that worked on the Guide to Wokeness. And so it was a lot of like, actually that book was crazy to write because we had about a month to write that and get oh, wow. all the graphics together and turn it in. Really? <laughs> and, you did yeah. it that fast? Yeah, and we did that, we did that really quick. <laughs> so uh, we, we have a new book, The Babylon Bee Guide to Democracy. And this one, we had a little extra time. We had about another month or two. And we had a larger art department. So we actually managed to like take our time and draw like because uh, a lot of those that you see in there are kind of like clip art. Like we take a stick figure and we quickly slap on mm. a, a hat on them or something like that. And this one, we had custom art for almost every joke that we did, which was really cool. But uh, yeah, mm. that, that was a lot. So Wokeness was a ton of fun to write, but I almost died. Um, <laughs> oh, Matt, that's so fast. I mean, actually, three <laughs> months is really fast. I mean, you right, think you yeah, want yeah. 10. Yeah, most time in a book, you get a year or you get six months, 12 months to work on it. This one, we had about a month. So, yeah. That's crazy. Now, let me ask you a question. This is going to sound really dumb, but uh, or not dumb, but it but, it, but you know, you get it. So like to what level, like when I, when, when I read the book when it came out last year, I mean, it's really hysterical, but it's actually um, it sounds like I'm brown nosing, but it's actually very profound it's like it's saying really deep things about what's going on it's actually explaining what's going on unfortunately maybe a little clearer than a lot of i would say maybe even a lot of pastors in america or church leaders i don't think they grasp what's going on half as clear as this book even though the book is polemic i mean to what level do you guys think hey we're you know, we're saying something that matters we're making a difference or i don't know is that sound, sounds cheesy but to what level do you feel that is what I'm saying? Well, it's a balance. I mean, I can't, it, it's hard. Cause comedy, comedy can suffer if you make that the main thing. You know, like if you, if you say our whole goal is to just, I like, I want people to understand this thing that I'm that trying to communicate. I mean, then you're not really looking for the funniest thing to say. 
But, but there's definitely truth in that, you know, the reason that people laugh at a joke a lot of times, especially a political joke or a worldview joke, is that there's truth to it. You know, it's funny because it's true is kind of the old uh, standby comment that we get. Um, but I, I think, I, you know, I, but comedy does communicate truth. And there's a there's a reason you laugh at something because you go, oh, man, that's so true. Whether it's political or observational comedy where someone's like, you know, what's the deal with grocery stores? And you're like, oh, yeah. You know, do you have any grocery store stand, uh, stand up? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I talk about grocery no stores. Grocery stores. No. Okay. The hackiest area I probably have is I have some plane airplane. But you have material, airplane jokes, but it's not the the airplane food. It's OK. But that's that whole topic, you know, is a, a very tried and true sort of airplanes area. Yeah. Well, I think I'm pretty, every time I'm on, an, I'm on an airplane, I start to like think of ideas because yeah. it's like. Oh, this is crazy. It's such a weird, like all these people smashed together in a two. Yeah. But as far as like the comedy and the sort of driving a, a point with it, it's like I, I always want to try to write a joke that is funny enough to make someone laugh, even if they disagree. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes you hit that mark, sometimes you miss it. But um, that's always the goal, I think, is you, you can really get people to kind of open up their mind to ideas that they might not be open to before they can lower their their apprehension about discussing things that they disagree with and and that's always the goal i think is to write a joke that's funny enough on its own and then you can kind of work the message in under that i we had a joke that we did that was the uh uh we're all in this together celebrities spell out with their yachts you know and it's like <laughs> <laughs> is there the <laughs> We we had a great Photoshop of all the boats lined up and saying we're all in this together, and people thought it was real. But we had a we made fun of what's the guy's name? Of? Patton, Oswalt. Patton Oswalt. Patton yeah. Oswalt. We made fun of Patton Oswalt in the in the article, you know, because he was one of the guys who was like making fun oh, of man. For, want, for wanting to leave their houses and go to work. Yeah, <laughs> it was his tweet about Fuddruckers. He had some. <laughs> you remember this? He had a tweet about Fuddruckers, and it was like, "Open up Fuddruckers!" Scream the people <laughs> as they bash on the door. Yeah, you know, and there's all these people who like got fired because of this, so it was like really insensitive. Obviously, anyway, he he shared our article, and he's like, "Okay, guys, you know, I gotta admit, you got me on this one or something." You know, and I, yeah, I it's cool. Like we made fun of him, and he shares it and goes, "This is funny," even though you're making fun of me. And I like I like that too myself. Like when I read an Onion article that makes fun yeah of Christians or conservatives and <laughs> or Trump or something, yeah. um, they had the one where. It was Trump kept saying Obama was spying on him. And they had the one where he like holds up the drill to his head. And he's oh, like, yeah. <laughs> the listening device is here. And he's like drilling. He's about to yeah. drill his own head. You know, it, I, I like when I can laugh at something, even though I'm like, well, I kind of disagree with you. But yeah. And Trump turned out to be right. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's that, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, it's. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm about to say something that's so completely obvious. That everybody has said. But but to kind of jumping off of that, I mean, I, I don't mind laughing at myself at all uh, or Christians. If if somebody says something funny, you go, all right, touche. You know, uh, you see that on, uh, you know, clips of South Park or something, you know, yeah. making fun of things that, that I that I love. I'm like, oh, at least it was funny. But this is what everybody has noticed. Things aren't really in general all that funny anymore. And that's what's so strange is I was kind of curious from your perspective to what degree do you think that that's the case or is it, it's not the case that we're just getting more sensitive or anything, right? I mean, it's, I remember thinking things used to be funny, even if I disagreed with them four years ago. Now, the, the, they just, the humor just doesn't seem funny. It just seems uh, stupid. I can't uh, like, do you guys can do better than that. You know, I feel like I can make fun of me better than you are. You're not doing a good job. <laughs> Well, I think that's a big part of it is to keep that sort of sense of self-deprecating humor alive in it. You know, we we make jokes. Obviously, we're a Christian platform. We're more conservative leaning. But a lot of the jokes we do, they have a sense of humor about our side. We're not afraid to make jokes about Republican candidates or the failing of the Republican Party or, you know, like we're talking about Christian culture. I, I think you always need to keep a sense of humor about yourself and be able to laugh at yourself. And I think as humor's gotten more agenda driven on both sides it people feel like it will undercut their message if they admit any sort of fault or take a shot at their own side um that's not in a heavy-handed way um so yeah i think that's been lost a little bit people really are getting more sensitive you know i i hate to say that but i i noticed that even going out at comedy clubs there are there are jokes that used to get laughs and now we'll get like oh you know or people <laughs> yeah uh i think people are getting more more sensitive about things but um uh yeah, I think we need to keep 
both having a sense of humor about ourselves and making jokes that, like I said before, making the funny part the most important part, and then you can kind of work your message in through that. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I, I, I like what you said, that you feel like you can make fun of yourself better than they can. Because <laughs> I, I feel the exact same way. You watch like a late night show or Steve, Stephen Colbert trying to attack Republicans or something, and you're like, I can think of a better joke. <laughs> yeah. and, and I completely disagree with you. <laughs> That's funny. But one... Well, I mean, go ahead. What I was going to say with Stephen Colbert, I, I think what sort of di- has disappointed me about him is I used to love Stephen right, Colbert. Right, right. And he was making fun of Republicans. Back when he did the Colbert Report, he was doing a conservative <laughs> character. But it was funny. And I think the way the sort of polarization has hurt comedy a lot is that like there's this theory in comedy called benign violation theory, where you kind of have to violate a rule, um, where you have to kind of do something either illogical or against a rule. When you have... Colbert on his side doing jokes just for people who agree with him. And then you have sort of right wing comedians doing jokes just for people that agree with them. There's not really fun there. You're not breaking any rules anymore. There's if, if everyone is already on the same side, there's very little to work off of there. It's it's like, you know, the, the cliche of like clapter. It's you're trying to make a point and not a joke. I yeah, stop us, stop us if we ramble too long, but it, it it's so like yeah, it's, it, it's almost just boring at some point. Like it's just not even fun. Um, and the, an- another thing that drives it too is the like the Facebook algorithm and the social media algorithms, and that hurts us even because it's like sometimes we'll have a good joke against Trump or against Republicans or making fun of our own side, and I'm like, you know, this joke is going to take a lot of work to write and Photoshop and whatever, and I know that it's not going to do well. You know, yeah. it's like nobody's going to read it because, and that's what I was talking about earlier, like the joke that we have to be committed to, even though I know nobody's going to read it. <laughs> it's so much easier. The algorithm kind of like pigeonholes you to go. We just have to make fun of Democrats because that's what's going to get people to click on our website and keep our lights on, you know, (laughs) which sucks, which brings me to another point, which is like one of the fun things that we can do, even though we know like a lot of our headlines have to make fun of the other side, uh, you know, to get the clicks or to get the following or whatever, is especially in longer form comedy like our videos, we can and you have a good knack for this, Adam, when we're writing a sketch, even if the sketch is completely making fun of Democrats or liberals we can throw in jokes that surprise people that are making fun of the conservative audience yeah. watching it. And I really like that when someone's watching it. We did the one, we did one, we, we had an, an uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez dating game, yeah. you know, and she's like talking to people and they're like, I disagree with you. And she's like, oh, you want to date me? And, you know, yeah, <laughs> making fun of right. that, she, that. That's her defense for everything is people want to date her. But in the middle of it, you had that line about the it was oh. like a Republican senator or something. Yeah. And he's like, I don't want to date you. Marriage is between a man and a woman. And my mistress, yeah, or my mistress and my side piece. and my side like Republican <laughs> senators. Yeah. You know, so you can make fun of immorality within the Republican Party. And, you know, a conservative is watching that going, yeah, get AOC, you know, and then you're like, oh, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. You're making fun of me, too. So their guards kind of down and you can make fun of, of, you know, people on our own side in that way, even if you're kind of pigeonholed with some of the algorithm stuff. So. Yeah. I don't know if I'm still answering your question. Well, and where the yeah. algorithm stuff bothers me a lot, especially coming from like the television <clears throat> world and stand up world. Uh, what like apart from any sort of politics or cancel culture sensitivity, those algorithms are always driven by these like key words and key phrases <laughs> that's trending that day. And it almost has nothing to do with whether the joke or the content mm-hmm. is good. It's like if you have, you know, a hot phrase like liberal destroys conservative or conservative destroys liberal or uh, whatever the buzz topic is that day, that will get way more views than something that's a, you know, a, a, a joke that's more subtle. Well, and, but, con- and conversely, the topics they don't want you to talk about, the algorithm immediately red flags. And I'd yeah. like, I know I can't put the word, you know, yeah, in, in a headline or it's not going to do well. You know, <laughs> every post that we did this week on YouTube has like the election information warning. <laughs> like, so like you, even if, if you mention the word election you right now, election. YouTube is like this God is, is sovereign the in election about you know, elections. Yeah. It gets flagged. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It, you know, it, it's actually a good transition to the one the one kind of serious question I want to ask. But it really is true. I've, I've experienced that on, you know, this little podcast that I do, which is uh, I'm like, why is I know that this is getting pushed down. I know this isn't getting the reach it typically does. I have, I'll have like six comments, you know, and I'm like, all right, come on. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, like my my kid could post, you know, hi and, and get more comments than this, you know, <laughs> what is going on? And it'll be because you said a word or something. And it does kind of present a very kind of 
a, uh, a false reality, as you said, to the world. Because when you see something getting a lot, whole lot of views, you go, oh, this must be what everybody thinks. And then if something's not getting any views, you go, oh, everybody disagrees with it. So it kind of, it's a way to kind of create a false, a false world. And all of a sudden it begins to change the way you think about things, which is kind of what I, I was going to ask you guys when that's serious that all of a sudden what you do becomes very serious when you guys got um, taken off of Twitter. Of course, that's changed now because of the new ownership and stuff. But all of a sudden that injects a very serious moment into Babylon B, the fact that you make your living online and now you don't have the, the access to do it and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, and we're st we are still locked out of Twitter. Um, we're not really sure when that. Oh, are you? Back. Yeah, we are still locked out. But um, uh, you know, fingers crossed. Hopefully that I I'm sure everything takes time to for all that stuff to change. But uh, yeah, it's you know that's something do you, where. Do you think that they will? What do you think will take longer to get you back onto Twitter or to finish the vote count in uh, <laughs> Nevada or wherever that is? Which one? We're taking bids. Taking bets, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Air, yeah, the Arizona vote count probably still going on. I don't know. I think they finished the governor count. I, you know, it's weird. I, I voted and I turned in my ballot and I, I had to do the mail-in ballot this time. And I, but I turned it in on election day, and they're like, okay, your vote will be counted within seven days. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Like, yeah. I, it's so it's weird. Like it's right there. And then that it. night on New York Times, like they already declared the winners of the races, and I'm like, well, good thing I voted then. Yeah, <laughs> which is just crazy. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we got we got locked out of Twitter for our joke. We were we called Rachel Levine, who's a a man. <laughs> a man. It's a man. We man. call a man a man. <laughs> right. It's a man, uh, baby. I don't even remember. I guess a deputy deputy secretary of health or something. Admiral the, Admiral Rachel Levine, Ad the, the <laughs> assistant assistant me, deputy Admiral. secretary of health. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we did a joke. You know, USA Today named Rachel Levine one of their women of the year. Yeah. So we said we gave uh, Rachel Levine our man of the year award and we were locked out. And it was so bizarre because the the wording on on the way that we were locked out was you're not really banned. You can come back at any time, but you have to click delete tweet and then acknowledge, read our hateful conduct policy, you know, and then click the button saying, yes, I violated this policy. And the And the policy is so broad, it's like. You called for violence against somebody, you know, you called somebody hateful slurs. You I'm like we just said like we just said man of the year, which is just a dumb little yeah. parody of what USA Today did. You know, so like obviously we're talking about truth and humor and like there's truth to it. And obviously they objected to the truth we were pointing out. At the same time, it was just a dumb joke, you know. <laughs> like can we just tell a dumb joke like that and get like I, and and it's bizarre to me that that is the joke that got us banned. Yeah, of and, all the things that we've said and that we've said and all the things that are on Twitter, like people People do the the crassest jokes, you know. It, stand up comics do horrible yeah. jokes. Like, like if you go look at any comedy special, it's like, oh, that's really gross and vile. And then us, it's like we tell this one joke and we get. <laughs> but so I, it's crazy. And it's I think strange. it is important that you know uh, Seth uh, and Joel and everyone here they were kind of on the same page that we were not <clears> going to delete it just to get back on. That is a big source of revenue. It's a big source of audience for us. Is getting stuff out on Twitter. But like Kyle was saying, that thing where you have to delete it yourself, it is a thing. They want you to bend the knee. It's part of this culture war where they want you to say, I did something wrong. We shouldn't have done that. I apologize. And, you know, it seems like a, a minor thing to some people. Why don't you just delete it and get your uh, right. account restored? But I think it's an, it was an important stand for them. To and take. we could have. I mean, we could have rolled our eyes and just been like, whatever, yeah. you know, and I'm not going to act like we changed the world or anything. But it was definitely like a moment where we said, OK, if we're going to die on any on any hill, it's a hill that you can call a biological male man and not be and not even in a hateful way. Not like we were like in Rachel Levine's replies, like, yeah, yeah. you're a horrible transgender person. We hate you. Blah, blah, blah. And then whenever our account is restored, we're going to impersonate Elon Musk's account and get banned again. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately change Immediately our game. Change <laughs> Sounds sounds like a great idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it is a little bit serious, but I really do mean it. And I just think it's a moment to, I don't know, to mention. I mean, as you said, look, you guys are a satire site. It's funny. It's comedy. What's the big deal? Delete the post. Get, you know, I, I get it. But the fact that you that you did it because you're like, hey, we're, we're not going to kind of bow down to somebody trying to force you to either say something that you don't believe or to not be able to speak what you believe. I just think it's worth 
I honestly, I just think it's worth um, commending, especially at, the, at a time when I see so many churches who are unwilling to do the same, just unwilling to stand up for anything that's going to cause, I don't know, any sort of blowback in the least. I mean, they will just run from it. And I'm just trying to understand what kind of world we live in when, when, when churches won't stand up for the truth, but the, but the Babylon Bee will stand ground. It, it just, it's honestly blowing my mind. But then I thought I would ask you, because you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, up until two or three years ago, I didn't even know there was the internet. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, do you agree that as far as the church goes, the way the church has a voice? I, am I right? In other words, has it changed or was it always like that? And I just didn't know it. Does that make sense? Has what changed? The, the church? Yeah. Has the church, has the church become more timid or was the church always timid and it just was never put to the test? I think there was a there was a tipping point with the wokeness thing, and I don't know when it was, like four or five years ago, where it became kind of like, I, even I was a little bit like, okay, like let's not freak out about the wokeness thing, because it always felt like that was just a thing on college campuses, and it wasn't going to escape into the real world, you know. But like a zombie movie, like the virus actually got out, you know, and now those people are the people running HR departments and companies, and and the people that are going to seminaries and running seminaries and getting into churches. Um, so I, I think there was kind of a progression where you saw it was happening in the schools and there were some people sounding the alarms in the seminaries and the schools, but we weren't listening, you know, <laughs> and then that mm. stuff kind of got out to the wider culture. So you do see it. I mean, I, there's tons, I mean, but there are, there are tons of faithful churches that are just doing nothing but preaching the gospel and not really worried about that stuff. And that's great. Obviously those people are, are going to save Christianity in the West, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, so. absolutely. So you but, think that, that you, you think that maybe there were people maybe saying it that they were in the university and saw it happening, but maybe the wider church uh, or wider evangelicals were like, yeah, I think they're maybe overstating it a bit or something like that. Yeah. Or just, you put your head in the sand. I mean, you don't want to think it's going to be a big problem and okay. you just kind of mock that stuff and, and, and it'll go away, but it won't. Cause those people that graduate college get hired into all these positions, whether that's at churches or seminaries. Yeah. I don't know as much of it, you know, from the the sort of church and the different denomination aspects as as maybe you do, but I, I think what I have found just from talking to Christians personally, and for instance, I grew up in the evangelical Lutheran church, which then became much more left-leaning, kind of progressive. Um, you know, I think there's two factions in the church. There are people out there who, you know, consider themselves Christian, who believe in Christ but have this interpretation of the Bible that is very left-leaning. And they do these sort of things, which I, I equate to like in the Bible where it says they'll they'll raise up teachers according to their own passions. They basically believe, well, if God loves everyone, everything they want to do must be okay. And, every you know, it's it's the sort of divide between loving the sinner but hate the sin. They think, well, this sin, we, we can celebrate it, and it's just part of who they are, and we have to celebrate it. And I think that's a very um, uh, unbiblical sort of interpretation now, I think where it also took root in the church, I think there's a lot of people out there who they their theology is in the right place, but in an effort to be loving and compassionate, they kind of don't want to uh, rock the boat. They want to be like, well, we want to welcome these people. We'll sort of back down on this argument. We'll kind of just say, well, you know, they're welcome here. But because that social movement in our culture pushes harder and harder, it's like you have to take a stand. You can't just say, well, we're not going to comment on this or we'll just kind of take the passive route because then you just kind of get steamrolled by this in the culture, I think. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it is, it is kind of a cultish religion where they won't, you know, you see people apologizing or trying to appease and that's not, like, that's not going to work with the woke crowd. Um, I mean, it, it, Elon Musk, when he bought, Twitter, <clears throat> he's, he was like immediately like, well, I'm going to be sensitive to these needs of the, mm. of the, of the ad companies that are canceling because they want to be next to inappropriate content. And he's like, I'm going to meet with all these groups, you know, to, uh, I don't know, all these sensitivity groups and diversity groups. And then like the, a day later, he tweets, well, there's no appeasing these people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, no matter what you do, they're going to they're going to eat you alive. Yeah. I, I'm glad at least he saw that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What a what a strange times. All right. So what is next for Babylon B? You got the new book out. What else is up with you guys? Yeah, we got a lot of stuff going on. Actually, today we launched, um, and I don't know when this is going up, but today we launched the uh, our B Live ticket sales for our B Live event. We're doing kind of a, a little mini B convention, a Babylon B convention, uh, out in Dallas on February 24th. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's our first live event. We're going to have 
a live podcast recording and some addresses and discussion panels from the stage and then a hangout with cigars and uh, non-alcoholic beverages, possibly. Uh, yeah, so, that, <laughs> so that would be a lot of fun with uh, with the Babylon B crew on February 24th uh, in Dallas. So we're, that's going to be a lot of That's at BabylonBlive.com if people want to check that out. Uh, what else we got coming up? We're, we've been we've been growing the YouTube channel a ton, so that's been one thing we focused on a lot this year was doing a lot more of our comedy sketches um, to kind of add to our articles. So we've still got the articles and the headlines that people share, and then we've got uh, we got a lot of video sketches, and that's we brought people like Adam on to help us write those scripts. And, and we just passed a million subscribers on our, on our main YouTube channel. And then uh, if any of your viewers are, are not subscribed, we also split off our podcast onto the Babylon B podcast channel. Um, so there's sort of two different destinations now, but it's all of our content. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so check that out. Awesome. Yeah, uh, the I, I, the uh, YouTube video you guys did about deconstruction. I don't know. It was a girl. She was like, you know, there, there was like, she's like, I deconstructed, and now, oh, yeah. it, oh my gosh, uh, ev- everybody I know got that video from me. <laughs> that was that was it was like the funniest thing in the whole yeah, what world was it she was know? talking about that was chandler that did that one she was talking about the uh deconstructing her faith and how she has this totally unique story of leaving christianity was that the just ex- like evangelical yeah. Yeah, yeah but it was yeah. just like everybody else just like everybody else <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was just so genius and then she's like and now it's basically that and then also you know now like I've learned how to love everybody, you know, except for those terrible, you know, those terrible Christians, you know, it's, it, it was just so funny. People really need to go see that anyway. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming on. I just wanted to talk with you because I've, I've just uh, enjoyed your, your post so much. So sometimes things are so insane. It's the only, the only funny, the only fun thing that happens in a day is to watch one of the posts uh, come up on Babylon B and, and <laughs> it's like, it's like a stress. It's like a, it's like letting a gasket off, you know, it's like a pressure release because you know that you're not it's like crazy. A fart. <laughs> it's like a humongous fart. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, and, and then, you know, you're not crazy because someone else has noticed it too, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. Yeah. I appreciate it guys. And uh, hope everybody had a great time watching this. Go check out Babylon B's YouTube stuff and uh, get the new book and all that sort of stuff. Have a great week. Read the Bible.